Okay, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to our uh, today's webinar. We have the pleasure to have with us Dimitri Gadotti today. Dimitri Gadotti from ESO, uh, people working in galactic dynamics uh, and galactic morphology know him very well. I remember we just said that in the past he has visited also our institute once here and we would be very glad uh, uh, soon to have uh, him again with us uh, in person, not only from the webinar to discuss our common interests. So Dimitri is a specialist uh, in uh, observational uh, uh, galactic dynamics, I would dare to say, because all whatever he does and part of his work will be presented today here gives uh, to uh, people doing modeling or theory uh, all the needed ingredients to verify theories and models. And this is very important for all people in the audience here and uh, for those some of those of you that uh, join us uh, over uh, the internet. So immediately we can start. I change here the view so that everybody can see you just you, you are on the screen. Uh, so get your PowerPoint and uh, full view and we can start. Right. Thanks uh, a lot, Panos, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be there, although only virtually. And it's true, I, I was there in 2007, I think it was, or 2006, yes. I don't 2007. know, 2007. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you can see the full screen now and also the laser pointer. Okay, yes, we yeah. can do it. And we hear you very well, so we can start. Okay. So um, what I'm going to present to you today is uh, a bit of a summary of two papers uh, that came out last year from the, the timer collaboration. So this is about the building of nuclear structures in barred galaxies. Uh, we use uh, data from the MUSE IFU spectrograph uh, on the VOT. Um, and and I'm going to put these results also in the context of the uh, of the MuQA. Uh, so let me start uh, with the MuQA. So why why I'm putting these results also in the context of the MuQA is because the MuQA is a barred galaxy. So you can see here on the left an artistic uh, representation of the MuQA, but this is based on uh, real data. So um, uh, you can see the bar here. It's this elongated structure that crosses the center of the galaxy. And, and the sun is in this position here. So the fact that the MuQA is barred is already uh, known since the early 90s, actually. Uh, in a paper by, by Bini and collaborators, they studied the kinematics of cold gas uh, in the MuQA, and they concluded that the best way to explain the observations was to impose uh, uh, a non axisymmetric gravitational potential, so a barred. Um, a potential a bar in in the in the Milky Way, and a few years uh, later, uh, the COBE satellite, which was, you know, the precursor of WMAP and and uh, Planck, to uh, measure the cosmic microwave background, they published this picture of the Milky Way, which was actually a, an astronomy picture of the day in 1995, and it shows this. Um, kind of boxy structure at the center of the Milky Way, which I will show in a minute is, um, is of course, um, the bar seen edge on. And we can even see in this image that the there's an asymmetry uh, in this uh, structure in the sense that the structure is wider on the sky on this side compared to this side. And this is simply a projection effect because remember, we are sitting here in the solar system, looking at the bar at an angle. So we are seeing this side of the bar closer than the other side of the bar. So this side of the bar looks um, bigger in the sky compared to this uh, to the other side. So that's why we see this, uh, this asymmetry. Uh, the Milky Way is not a special galaxy because it has a bar actually, um, sorry, actually bars are, are frequent uh, in these galaxies. So typically about two thirds of, of these galaxies at redshift zero have bars. And, and we see also that the fraction of bars decreases with redshift. So this can be seen in this panel here. So we can focus only on this top panel, which shows the total bar fraction as a function of galaxy mass. So this is the, the bottom panel is for strong bars only, but we can focus on the total bar fraction. Um, and we see uh, three different redshift beams, so black, 
corresponds to local galaxies, more local galaxies. And then blue and red are progressively higher redshift galaxies uh, up to redshift close to one. So we see that the fraction of barred galaxies decreases uh, with redshift, but it doesn't decrease uh, homogeneously in mass. It decreases more strongly uh, for lower masses. In fact, we see that even at redshift uh, close to one, for high mass galaxies, uh, the fraction of bars is already almost 50%. So this is basically what uh, similar to the downsizing picture of galaxy formation in the fact, uh, in, in the sense that um, bars will form first in more massive galaxies and then later on in, uh, in the least massive galaxies. So just to show you an example about bars in higher redshift. So the, hi the highest uh, redshift bar detected today is about uh, redshift two. This is a paper by Simons et al. Uh, using Galaxy Zoo uh, framework. They, they calculate the bar fraction at redshifts uh, larger than one. So you can see here again, the bar fraction as a function of redshift and these uh, black data points are from this work. Um, and they find the strong bar fraction. This is only the strong bar fraction. Uh, it's about 10% at redshift 1.7, what they, what they have here. So there are already bars um, at, at those uh, higher redshifts. You can find uh, some galaxies uh, in their sample in this, uh, these two rows here. So on top, I'm showing unbarred galaxies uh, at different redshifts. And then at similar redshifts, uh, we see uh, barred galaxies. So this is the highest redshift bar that, that we see today at redshift 2. You can see that this is a bit of a tentative result. Of course, this, uh, these bars are difficult to detect at, uh, at these redshifts, but at least this case here is very clear. This is redshift 1.3 and you can clearly see a bar and even some, something similar to a grand design spiral arms here. And I expect that the, actually this, these results might change a little bit with you know, uh, the EOT or improving uh, instrumentation because this, these are difficult things to, to find that these redshifts and this, these numbers might increase um, in the future. So bars are important, uh, not only because they are present since uh, high redshifts and in a, in a high fraction of these galaxies, but they are important because they also drive uh, significant evolutionary processes um, in these galaxies. And you can see, uh, for example, when you look at uh, some numerical simulations, so this is a simulation of a pure disk of stars. So we are starting with an axisymmetric disk. So here seeing face on, here I join. And uh, after 700 mega years, so this is the time in mega years, in giga years, after 700 mega years, the bar, uh, it's already present there and it remains there until the end of the simulation, which is uh, more than five giga, four giga years uh, later on. So bars uh, are robust structures, it seems that, uh, to destroy them, you, you really need um, uh, a re reasonably violent merger, for example. Uh, it's difficult to destroy bars internally. And something else that you can see here, how bars can produce uh, effects on the dynamics of stars is basically because if you have an unbarred disk, most of the forces here uh, are, are radio forces, right? Uh, and once you, you, you have a bar developed in the disk, you have uh, tangential forces ap applied in the stars in the disk because of the non axisymmetric component of the gravitational potential that appears, appears now. So you have tangential forces in the disk. So this causes a lot of um, changes in the, in the dynamics of stars. Um, and one thing that, that happens is that the disk expands and, and the central concentration uh, in the disk also increases. Basically, there is a removal of angular momentum from um, uh, stars within the bar radius. Uh, so they sink to the center and, and the disk expands as um, in, in the opposite direction as because of the conservation of angular momentum basically. Uh, in, in terms of gas, uh, there is also an effect of course in the dynamics of gas because of the, of the development of the bar. So here's a hydrodynamical simulation where you see the bar is elongated in this direction. And what you're seeing here is the gas surface density. So whiter shades represent um, a more uh, dense gas surface density. And we can see that the gas piles up in the leading edges of the bar. So the bar is rotating counterclockwise here. 
So it piles up in the leading edges of the bar, it loses angular momentum there uh, through shocks and, and then funnels down to the central region. You can see here a zoom of the central region where it will um, be in a, in, a, in a configuration, kind of disc-like, ring-like uh, configuration. And we're gonna talk a lot about uh, what happens to this gas uh, when it reaches the center. Uh, another thing that bars uh, do during their evolution is that they form uh, so-called peanuts or box peanuts or boxy bulges. There are many different numbers for these structures, but basically this is simply the bar seen at John. So here there's another simulation where you can see the bar uh, in the horizontal uh, direction. Here's a face on uh, image. And if you're looking at this galaxy edge on toward, from this direction, you see um, that after some time, the bar that develops initially vertically thin, so it's the same height of the, of the disk of the galaxy. At some point, the, 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 um, the bar develops a, a vertical extension as well. Uh, so it grows out of the plane of the disk um, creating this, uh, these structures which uh, could look like a, kind of a boxy structure. In this case here is more like a peanuts-like or even an X-shaped structure. And so you see uh, many different names for this structure, X-shaped bulge, etc. And this basically is just the same uh, physical structure seeing a different projections. And also the, the, the final shape of this structure might depend a little bit on whether there is a classical bulge in there or other, other structures in the galaxy. But basically, uh, this is just the, the bar seen edge on. And you can see uh, in observations, this is a galaxy um, taken with HST, which shows a very similar morphology for this boxy structure in the center. One thing that is interesting to note is that if you are looking at this bar from this direction, so what we call end on, you see the, the end of the bar here, and it will look like a spheroid. So morphologically, you know, many people would think, okay, this is a classical bulge. This is a central hot spheroid at the center of the, of the disk galaxy, but it's actually just the bar seen uh, end on. So um, you can imagine that morphologically, there can be a confusion between what kind of central structure we are seeing here. But again, um, if you have kinematic data, you can uh, probably, realize that this is actually a bar. So uh, we have to be careful with uh, projection effects when you have bars in, in galaxies. So from observations, we see also that uh, gas piles up at the uh, leading edges of the bar. So you can see these, uh, these dust lanes here along the leading edges of the bar, the bar is rotating uh, clockwise in this image. And this is basically uh, gas and dust again, losing angular momentum at the, at the leading edges of the bar and going towards the center where you see that there is a structure here um, that possibly is being built by the gas that uh, is funneled to the center because the gas, what, what will happen to the gas when it reaches the center presumably would form stars. So uh, you can see um, this bluish color here compared to the bar looks like indeed there are younger stars in this, in this uh, image. Uh, and we also see that barred galaxies, in fact, have larger concentration of, of, of molecular gas in the central region. So this is being known since the late 90s. This is from Sakamoto et al. So this is a plot where in the, in the y-axis we have the uh, surface density of molecular gas within 500 parsecs from the center of the galaxy. Uh, plotted against the surface density of molecular gas, basically within the whole uh, disk of the galaxy. So these lines here are lines of uh, constant central concentration, and and the and this corner of the plot represents higher central concentration of molecular gas. And there's a number of galaxies plotted in here, and the barred galaxies are the field squares, and the unbarred galaxies are the open squares. So you can see that there's a clear separation between bars and unbarred galaxies here in the sense that uh, bar galaxies show higher central concentration of, um, of molecular gas compared to unbarred galaxies, as we would expect from this um, dynamical picture. This has been also found later on with, with more data by uh, Sheth et al. And so what happens to the gas? So I've said already, okay, it's probably forming stars. And in fact, we see that barred galaxies have um, higher star formation rate in the center 
compared to unbarred galaxies. So this is from Ellison et al, where they find, so they plot here basically the excess of central star formation uh, in a barred galaxy sample compared to an unbarred galaxy sample for different uh, beams of stellar mass. So this is done with uh, the slow and digital sky survey and it's just like the fiber star formation rate. So this is uh, at the center of the galaxy. <clears throat> And uh, you can see that for lower uh, galaxy masses, there's no difference between bars and unbarred uh, galaxies. But when we move towards more massive galaxies, you see that um, the, the star formation rate is higher uh, in the center uh, for barred galaxies compared to unbarred galaxies. There are also a number of other papers that uh, have uh, found this. And uh, we also had a look at this, but not uh, only in terms of the the current star formation rate, but in terms of the stellar population ages in the center of massive, uh, in the center of barred galaxies. So these are histograms of the distribution of stellar ages in the center of um, barred and unbarred galaxies. So the bars are the red line and the unbarred galaxies, the black line. And this is the same plot, but again, in different beings of galaxy mass. And uh, what you find is that for low uh, galaxy masses, there's no difference between bars and unbarred galaxies in terms of, of the um, star formation rate, or the, in terms of the uh, stellar population ages. Uh, but when we go to more massive galaxies, you see that in the bar uh, sample uh, appears a dichotomy in the sense that um, we see a lot of uh, barred galaxies uh, with uh, quite young uh, central uh, regions, um, which is again consistent with this scenario of the bar pushing gas to the center and forming um, younger stars in the center. So let's get, uh, let's make a step back now and try to look at the bigger picture now. So the classical picture that we have of the central region of these galaxies is a bit different from what I've been telling you. So basically this classical picture is what we have here where um, the central region of the galaxy is um, amorphous, homogeneous, um, contains older stars. And if you have kinematic uh, data from, for the stars here, you would see that this um, component appears to be a spheroid that is uh, dynamically supported by random motion of the star, so with high velocity dispersion. But this is the picture of the classical bulge um, that we, we've, we've discussed um, in, in, in the, the classical uh, picture of galaxy formation and evolution. And we think that these classical bulges are built um, in violent processes such as mergers or also via the coalescence of clumps in the disks at high redshifts that we perform most of these uh, spheroids. But I, what I've been telling you up to now is that, okay, on the other hand, if you have a bar, uh, you will push gas to the center and you can form uh, a structure in the center uh, that, that we're gonna look in more detail in a bit. Uh, we don't know at this point what, what, what it is. I'm gonna show you later, uh, but there's a structure here that looks different from the classical bulge. Um, and has been called uh, by, by some people like pseudo bulge or a disk bulge or a disk like bulge um, because it kind of have properties similar to disks. But um, are these pseudo bulges really uh, disks? So, this is what we, uh, we wanted to do uh, in this work, uh, what we, we tested. And this, of course, uh, has implications for how we see galaxy formation. Uh, because this enriches the picture of galaxy formation. Basically, we don't have only the classical picture, but we have something else producing central structures, producing um, what we, we could call them bulges. Um, uh, but I will tell, I will show later that we should stop calling them bulges. But anyway, um, this is a different picture for the formation of central structures in, in galaxies that involves bars. Uh, if, if this uh, these structures are indeed um, nuclear disks built by the bars, then what we expect is that they will be kinematically cold in contrast to the immersion built hot spheroids, the classical bulge that we find in other galaxies. And these structures, if they are built by bars, then if they are also uh, very important because they can tell us uh, something uh, about the, the history of the galaxy. So first of all, 
uh, it can tell us the age of the bar because the oldest stars in these uh, structures will tell us when the bar formed and push gas to the center for the first time and form stars there. So we can tell the age of the bar from the star formation history of these structures. It can also tell us um, the what we call the gas accretion history uh, for the galaxy, because every time the gas is made available within the bar radius so that the bar can push the gas to the center, you see a peak of star formation in this um, in the star formation history of this uh, structure. So we can see how much uh, gas accretion events, how many gas accretion events have had um, have happened in the in the galaxy. So in a pilot study that we published uh, a few years back with MUSE data, we actually looked at one galaxy in the Virgo cluster, NGC 4371, um, and we found that um, the structure that we find in the center is um, is very old. In fact, the, uh, it, the ages of the stars are about 10 giga years old. The whole galaxy is very old. And uh, this led us to conclude that the bar in this galaxy is also very old, um, with about 10 giga years old, which uh, gives us a redshift of 1.8. So similar to the oldest bars that are found uh, with the Galaxy Zoo project um, via photometry. And in this case, uh, it's interesting that this galaxy is in the Virgo cluster. So what, what we think happened is that uh, the galaxy um, formed the bar all the gas that was available uh, in the in the disk was funneled to the center, produced a new structure in the center, and this was this happened ten years ago. And then, because the galaxy is in the Virgo cluster, there's no more gas available for the bar to push gas to the center. And then, so you remain with a node bar and a node central structure that is nonetheless it's old, but it's not a classical bulge; it's just a, a structure built by the bar a long, long, long time ago. So after we did this pilot study, of course, we wanted to do uh, more galaxies. So with this, um, with, with, with this idea in mind, we initiated the timer project with Muse. So Muse is revolutionizing the field of, of um, structure of, of galaxies and uh, galaxies at high redshift and, and, and a lot of stuff uh, being done with this instrument now um, on, on galaxy evolution because um, of, of most of all because of the spatial sampling. This is a very high spatial resolution that we can observe things. And also because of the sensitivity of the instrument that um, produces very high signal to noise uh, spectra. So just a quick summary, it, it's an IFU spectrograph. So it means that uh, for every um, pixel in the image, we basically have one spectrum. Uh, and it covers a relatively large field of views, one arc minute, which for this kind of uh, instrument is a large um, uh, field of view. The spaxos are very small, it's 0.2 arc seconds. So this is why uh, the, the spatial sampling is high and the spatial resolution is high. And for every pointing that we make with, with, with um, the telescope, we basically get almost 100,000 uh, spectra. So it's a massive data set. There's a lot of information that we can get from, from the field, as you see. It covers the whole optical range. Uh, essentially, there's, there's a bit of a lack on the blue uh, wavelength range, but this doesn't affect um, our, our studies uh, significantly. And the resolution is is not very high, but it's enough to uh, study stellar populations and, and stellar kinematics. So we did, uh, we started this survey um, with 24 galaxies. So we are basically pointing at the central region of the galaxy. And this corresponds to a few kiloparsecs, depending on how distant the galaxy is. All these galaxies are, are nearby, are within 40 megaparsecs. And they are all barred. And they were all uh, visually identified to have structures that kind of look like they were built by the bar uh, so that we can study what, what these structures are. So here I show uh, two examples of um, the galaxies we observed. Uh, and you can see also the Muse field of view. So you see, we only see the central region in some cases. In other cases, we have the whole bar of the galaxy, which is oriented in this direction. And again, for every pixel in this image, we have um, we have a spectrum. So in the next slide, I'm going to show only uh, what we get within the Muse field of view with the Muse uh, reconstructed images. So basically, this is like collapsing all the spectra and produce, producing a reconstructed image from the spectra. So 
it's it's really impressive that you can make images with this quality um, with a spectrograph essentially. So this is this is very good, uh, and you can see what we are actually studying from from this galaxy. So again, here you see basically the central region, and and here we cover most of the of the bar, uh, the whole bar, and, and even parts of the outer disk. I also produced uh, color maps from these images. So basically, these are um, G minus I color maps. So basically, black shades here correspond to redder um, uh, colors, and, and white shades correspond to bluer colors. So you can see again that you, you have bluer uh, stars in the central regions of this galaxy. So again, okay, there is gas, this gas is being transformed into stars, it looks like. And, and you can see again the gas fall, uh, falling down towards the center um, along the leading edges of the bar. So before I show the, um, the results that we get from the, from the kinematic maps to test this, if these structures are indeed kinematically code, I want to um, uh, talk about the GIS pipeline because we, uh, when we started to get all this data, of course, there was a challenge to study this literally millions of spectra that we got um and to to you know run the 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 normal algorithms to to study the stellar kinematics and stellar population properties to understand if what we were doing was correct and and how to do this efficiently for for millions of spectra so we developed the gis pipeline um this is from my uh, former phd student adrian bittner and he basically cr created um sorry i have to close this uh Basically, he created um, uh, a, a wrapper of the of the the some of the algorithms that are used to to produce maps of stellar populations and maps of stellar kinematics. But the most uh, interesting thing, actually, from this uh, tool, is this uh, visualization interface uh, that we have. So basically, this is one of the velocity fields of one of our galaxies from the Muse data cubes. And you can click on on the spatial beings anywhere in the galaxy, and you can see the the spectrum and from that beam and the fits, and you can already see the star formation history and the the metallicity and age distributions and even the alpha content uh, for 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 that uh, spectrum in that in this Voronoi beam. So this allowed us to understand better what we could get from the data and to improve um, our analysis and, and to improve the, the interpretation. So if you work when, uh, with uh, IFU data, I, I think it's a good idea to have a look at this, um, this tool. So, uh, yeah. So here, here are the uh, two example maps of the stellar kinematics that we find for, for two of the galaxies that I showed earlier on. So basically what you're seeing here is the, the velocity field, the stellar velocity field. Here is the velocity dispersion. And here are the higher order moments of the, of the velocity distribution. I will explain what they are in a minute. So that they are called H3 and H4. So these are maps of H3 and H4. And the same thing for the galaxy on the right side. So what we see, and actually what we've seen in, in essentially all the galaxies that we studied, is that the central component is rotating fast. Uh, it has low velocity dispersion. So this, this already tells us, okay, it's a kinematically cold structure. And we also see uh, an anti-correlation between this parameter H3 and the velocity. So if, so if you look here in the central region, you have red, so positive H3 in this, in this region and then negative velocity, so blue in this region and the opposite on the other side. So there's an anti-correlation with H3 and V which means uh, that um, the orbits of stars in this uh, structure are, are close to circular. And I'll show you in a minute how, how, wh why, why is that the case. The H4 parameter uh, also, we show elevated, we see elevated values of H4 in the central region, which um, also indicate, you can see also here, also indicate that the structure that is in the center, this rapidly rotating structure that we can call a nuclear disk um, is sitting on top of the rest of the galaxy. It's not just the inner part of the disk, of the main disk, it's a different disk um, that is sitting on top of the of the bar of the main disk of the galaxy that uh, is, is there in the, in the center. And I'll, I'll explain to you uh, how. So basically, 
uh, here, here I can explain to you what H3 and H4 mean. So basically, we, when we measure the kinematics of stars, we are assuming that the line of sight velocity uh, distribution of stars is a Gaussian, but we allow deviations from, from the Gaussian. So if the Gaussian is a, is a, is a pure Gaussian, so if the, if the velocity distribution is a pure Gaussian, then we have a shape like this. But uh, if the H3 value is different um, from zero, then we have this kind of asymmetries in the Gaussian. So this is a negative H3 value, and this is a positive H3 value. So you see that for a negative H3 value, we have a tail of low velocities um, um, on this side. For positive H3 values, you have uh, a tail of, of high velocities. So this means that uh, how do we make the step from this to, to uh, figure out that this, the orbits are circular? Basically, if you have uh, orbits close to circular orbits, that means that um, uh, most of the stars have these uh, velocities, but known star can have velocities higher than the circular velocity. So you see a sharp drop in the in in the in this in the stars that are close to to the circular velocity so this creates uh, an elevated value of h3 that anti correlates with velocity so if the velocity uh, is positive uh, you're going to see a sharp drop close to the positive circular speed but you're going to have a lower uh, velocity tail of stars that that do not reach uh, the circular speed and the same same on the other side so this uh, this is how we interpret the H3V anti-correlation that shows that the orbits are close to circular. And then concerning H4, so again, uh, it's, a, it's a deviation from, from the Gaussian distribution. So a pure Gaussian will be this uh, case here. And positive values of H4 is, is this uh, uh, asymmetry in the Gaussian. So basically, uh, you see that there are um, wings of higher um, sigma at the base of the Gaussian. So basically, when we see elevated uh, values of H4, it, it tells us that there are two different structures um, in that region because we have two different values of velocity dispersion for the stars. And in fact, what we interpret is that the nuclear disk has low velocity dispersion, as we've seen, and, and it's sitting on top of the main disk, uh, which has higher velocity dispersion uh, because it has the bar also there. And, and this produces this value of uh, elevated value of H4. So I also want to just uh, uh, exemplify how Muse is, uh, is an eye opener, uh, literally, um, for, this, for this kind of studies. So this is a, a velocity fields. So it's again, it's V sigma H3 and H4. Um, for the same galaxy uh, observed uh, with Muse now, you see it, see it now. And then a comparison with Sauron, um, which was taken a few years back, well, several years back, of the same, the same galaxy. And you see that when you have Muse, uh, it's basically like putting your glasses on and you can see uh, a lot better the, um, the structure in the velocity field uh, of the galaxy. So there's really a game changer for this uh, kind of study. So coming back to the uh, the kinematic map, so this is all expected uh, as as in the scenario of uh, BART built uh, nuclear disks, and in fact you can see also uh, in terms of V over sigma maps. So these are V over sigma maps uh, for two of our galaxies. So you see the nuclear disk here with elevated values of V over sigma, so uh, rotationally supported. It's same same thing here. And you can see that also that it's a separate structure from the main disk. So you can see here the bar is elongated in this direction. And, and you can start to see the, 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 the main disk dominating in this area here. Uh, but this is a different structure from the main disk. It's, it's elongated al along the same direction, of course, but um, it's a different structure. It's separate from, from the main disk. Uh, so you can see also uh, V over sigma radio profiles. So these are for most of the galaxies in our sample, but let's focus on one galaxy. So this panel here. So this V over sigma is a function of radius uh, for each uh, spatial beam in the galaxy from, from our data. So you can see that when we are going further from the center, uh, we are looking at the main galaxy disk. So we have high values of V over sigma, something like five. And then uh, it drops 
uh, as you would expect, towards the central region. And if there was no nuclear disk there, then this, this drop will basically reach zero or close to zero. Um, but because of the presence of the nuclear disk, there is a secondary peak uh, in the center. So you can see basically this in all galaxies uh, in our sample, um, which is the presence of the nuclear disk. And this allows us also to define uh, a kinematic radius for the nuclear disk, which is the radius in which uh, V over sigma peaks. And we will use this uh, later on. So just uh, as a sanity check, we also plotted our nuclear disks in this famous uh, diagram, which is typically used for early type galaxies, but we thought it was a good idea to check. Also, this is the angular momentum um, within the nuclear disk as a function of the ellipticity of the nuclear disk and um, elliptical galaxies that follow the fall below this dashed line are called um, uh, slow rotators. So they are um, dynamically supported by random motion. And in this region above, uh, we have fast rotators and you see that um, essentially all of our uh, nuclear disks are in the region occupied by fast rotators. So uh, this is just to be sure that everything is consistent. And we can also study these nuclear disks now uh, as a population, right? Um, so this I'm showing here the distribution of the peak of V over sigma uh, for the for the, the different uh, nuclear disks we found. So you see that they have uh, V over sigma larger than one, of course, and they kind of uh, distribution is kind of skewed towards higher values, uh, but they are not super high uh, values of V over sigma, right? The main galaxy disks in the outskirts of the galaxies will have values uh, much larger, even uh, around 10. Um, so these disks are not so cold as main galaxy disks, but um, they are rotationally supported. And, and this, is, this makes sense actually that they are not so cold because they are in the central region of the galaxy where um, random motions are important. And, and so they are basically a little bit uh, thick um, nuclear disks. And this is the distribution of the sizes of the nuclear disks. So they range uh, from about 100 parsecs to, to, a, to a kiloparsec. Um, and what I show here with the dash line is actually one simulation uh, from Cole et al, where they simulate the formation of the nuclear disk in, in one galaxy. And this is the result that they find for this uh, nuclear disk in the simulation. So it's basically consistent with our observations, although I'm gonna show uh, in a minute uh, something that they are not reproducing. So yeah, so basically in this slide. So, uh, so at, at, at this point, okay, we show that um, these structures in the center are, are kinematically cold, are nuclear disk, and it's consistent with the formation um, scenario that is driven by the bar. But one could imagine also that uh, a flyby or an interaction with another galaxy could push gas to the center uh, and form a nuclear disk uh, without any interference uh, from a bar. So to, to really, uh, be sure that this is, these are formed from, from bars. We investigated this diagram. So here I'm plotting the radius of the bar as a function of the kinematic radius of the nuclear disk. So we see uh, a good correlation, um, which you would not expect if, if the formation of the nuclear disk is, uh, is unrelated to the bar. We can also see on this side, uh, a correlation between the, the, the size of the nuclear disk and the bar to total fraction. Okay, there is an outlier here that um, we don't know how to explain actually, but, but uh, you, you see a good uh, trend here. And here there's another trend, it's not really a strong correlation, but there is another trend which is important, which is an anti-correlation or anti-trend between the radius of the nuclear disk and the ellipticity of the bar. And this is understood in terms of the uh, orbital configuration of bars because the nuclear disk cannot be wider than the bar. So you will only see um, large disks in, in bars that are not very eccentric. Um, and, and, the, and the more eccentric bars will have uh, a smaller uh, nuclear disk. So these are all consistent, again, with the picture that, it's, um, that the nuclear disk is built by the bar. And what is interesting here is that um, the nuclear disk has uh, more or less 10% of the size of the bar length. And this is where the simulation of Cole et al. runs into trouble because they actually, the nuclear disk that they produce is three times uh, as, as large than this 10% uh, here. They, 
they find a nuclear disk that is actually a third of the size of, of their bar. So actually it, it falls um, above this plot here. Um, so this is something that they need, uh, well, we need to understand uh, better in the, in the, in, from the theoretical side, from the simulation side, how to produce realistic nuclear disks. And now I want to go back to the question that I asked in the, in the beginning, are these nuclear disks what is called a pseudo bulge or photometric uh, exponential bulge? Uh, so I want to um, remind you how pseudo bulges uh, were first found and how they are typically discussed in the literature today is via photometric decomposition. So basically um, forget about this, these two diagrams here, let's focus on this two on the right. So basically, if you have the surface brightness profile of a galaxy uh, that looks more or less like this black line, so this is schematic, of course, but the surface brightness radio profile will look more or less like this black line, and you decompose the profile or you decompose the image with a bulge and a disk, you have a disk that is exponential um, in this direction here, and you have a bulge that has uh, this profile that has kind of this shape here. This is the shape that is expected for, for, for spheroidals, um, so for, for classical bulges. But some of the bulges actually, they are better fit with an exponential. And this is what uh, has been called as, um, as a pseudo bulge. When you don't have any information about um, the kinematics or the stellar population of, of the central region. And so what we did is for, the, for our nuclear disks, we looked at uh, state-of-the-art decompositions um, from the literature, from, from Kim et al. and Salo et al. And they actually, they find in fact, an exponential light profile for our nuclear disks. So this uh, suggests that indeed, this kind of structures that you find photometrically and you call them pseudo bulges are, uh, are actually uh, nuclear disks. This is not to say that every decomposition will be, will retrieve, uh, this exponential profile correctly because it depends a lot on, on the data of the on the quality of the data and on the uh, sophistication of the of the decomposition. So it's something that uh, you have to be careful about. There's an even uh, more interesting test to ascertain whether the nuclear disk and pseudo bulges are the same structure, which is actually looking at the sizes that we derived kinematically. So the peak of Vera Sigma compared to the size that is derived um, for the nuclear disks or for the pseudo bulges um, photometrically. Uh, so the effective radius of the, of the pseudo bulge. And so here, what I plot is the ratio of these um, two values, which um, uh, shows that, that, that they are correlated. Basically they follow uh, a normal distribution in which the sigma corresponds actually to the error in the derivation of the of the uh, of the sizes, um, so basically the size of the two structures is the same, which which points out to the two structures actually being the same. So the photometric exponential bulge, or the photometric uh, pseudo bulge, corresponds to our kinematical uh, code um, uh, nuclear disks. So in fact, we could stop calling them. Um, bulges to, to avoid confusion with, um, with the classical picture of bulges and just call them for what they are physically, which is uh, nuclear disks. So um, changing a little bit the topic, I just want to show quick, quickly one uh, interesting finding we, we had, which corresponds to the stellar orbits of bars. So basically uh, what we found in, in, in uh, many of the, of the bar galaxies in our uh, sample was actually in the region that is dominated by the bar, we found a correlation between V and H3, not an anti-correlation as in the nuclear disk that corresponds to uh, close to circular orbits, but a correlation. And this correlation um, means uh, elongated orbits actually. So uh, you can see here uh, in this galaxy, for example, the region where the bar dominates um, is, uh, is shown here uh, in this, uh, in this uh, area here on this side and on this area here on the side. And you see that when H3 is positive, uh, the velocity is also positive. And when H3 is negative, the velocity is also um, negative uh, in the bar region. 
Then we see the anti-correlation again in the nuclear disk and in the main disk, but in the region where the bar dominates, um, we, see, we see the correlation. And the same thing we can find also here. So we see uh, blue on this side and blue on this side, red on this side, red on this side. So this is the, uh, what we expected for, for elongated orbits in, in the bar. And we can also find uh, signatures of um, the box peanuts. Uh, this has been shown by, um, by, by Victor de Batista in 2005, uh, that if, if the galaxy is seen in a projection close to phase on, it's difficult to see the, the box peanut, of course, because uh, you only see them clearly when they are edge on. Uh, but they have a signature in the, um, in the kinematic maps in the sense of uh, two minima in the H4 uh, where the, where the peanut uh, is present. So we found this in some of our galaxies too. So the bar is elongated in this direction. And we found so elevated values of H4 where the nuclear disk is. But then when the bar dominates, we see uh, that, that H4 drops um, to uh, negative values. Um, so there's this minima in H4 is a signature of the, of the box peanut in, the, in this galaxy. So just to show you uh, more uh, galaxies in our sample. So this is a gallery of the V over Sigma maps. And you can see uh, the nuclear disks basically everywhere in, in our sample showing elevated values of, of V over Sigma in the center, which contrasts with um, with what you expect from, from classical bulges, which show low values of, of V over Sigma. And continuing with the nuclear disk, we also study the stellar population properties of these nuclear disks. So this is uh, what typically what we found for, for one galaxy, but we found typically for, for the whole sample. So this is a map of, of uh, mean stellar age. So you, again, you see the bar here and the nuclear disk. So you see that the nuclear disk has younger stars um, compared to the bar and the rest of the, of the central region of the galaxy. So consistent with our picture of bar driven formation. It has also higher metallicity, which is also uh, consistent with, with this picture. So we have stars progressively being produced with uh, more and more metal rich gas. And we have low um, uh, alpha over iron abundance in the central region, which indicates that the star formation in this structure happens at a relatively long time scale, uh, which produces this uh, low uh, values of uh, alpha element abundance um, in, this, in this region, which contrasts again with a fast, violent uh, star formation for, for classical bulge. So all as expected as um, in the bar-driven origin. Something very interesting that we also uh, found was by, by looking at the gradients of age, metallicity, and alpha over iron. So this is for one of the, of the nuclear disks. And this dashed line here is the kinematic radius. So it basically corresponds more or less to the end of the nuclear disk, uh, which is, this, this is the sigma profile. So this is um, a minimum in the profile corresponds to the end of the nuclear disk. And you see, for example, in the age, that the age gradually decreases um, from the center towards the end of the nuclear disk with a single slope. On average, you see a similar um, behavior for alpha over iron and metallicity. So this suggests that the nuclear disk uh, is, it goes all the way to the center of the galaxy. It's not, just, uh, it's not just a ring, but it goes all the way to the center of the galaxy because of this lack of a break in the, in the, in the slope of, of ages. And um, it also suggests that the nuclear disk is formed inside out. So, so the, the first um, formation of stars happen very close to the center and it starts growing uh, inside out where more gas is, is sent to the center of the galaxy. So actually, <clears throat> this is what uh, we, we put forward for the formation of this nuclear disk because we were um, in, the, in the picture of bar driven uh, gas to the center, driving gas to the center and forming uh, stars there, uh, you typically see uh, nuclear rings of star formation uh, where this gas piles up. And then we were thinking, okay, so how could you form a nuclear disk that goes all the way to the center from rings? And the idea is that uh, since the nuclear ring radius uh, depends on the length of the bar, 
and bars um, tend to grow longer with time, it, we, what we thought is that the, as the bar grows longer, the, the radius of the nuclear ring grows uh, longer as well. So you could form uh, a nuclear disk from a succession of concentric nuclear rings that uh, grow with time. So you have star formation happening in rings, but these rings are growing in time. And then you form a, a nuclear disk that starts from the center towards uh, the end of the of the nuclear disk, uh, as, as we have seen. So this is uh, the scenario that we put forward, which needs to be investigated to see if it really happens this way. Um, so another important thing to, to think about all these results is that, that we didn't find any uh, massive hot spheroid in the center of these galaxies. And uh, this is, was a bit puzzling. Of course, our sample is, uh, is biased, is selected to have uh, bars, but uh, you could have um, uh, a, nu a classical bulge in a barred galaxy as well. If you have, uh, you can imagine a minor merger happening at redshift uh, two, say, and then forms a classical bulge, forms a hot spheroid, and then the bar develops later on uh, so you could still have uh, both things in the same galaxy, but we didn't find any massive um, classical bulge in, in our uh, sample, which is a bit uh, surprising. So, of course, this is a bias sample again, but um, we, we, we got curious about this and we, we, we are starting to investigate uh, the presence of, of hot spheroids in a, in a larger sample, trying to get rid of the biases, uh, including barred and unbarred galaxies. And, and to see how many uh, hot spheroids, how many classical bulges uh, we find, which could be then compared with um, hierarchical um, you know, cosmological simulations or the formation of, um, of classical bulges. So uh, this is my um, second to last slide. Let's get back to the Milky Way now. Um, so the Milky Way is a barred galaxy. And um, so all these processes I've been uh, telling to you should happen in the Milky Way as well. And in fact, there is evidence for a nuclear disk um, in, the, in the Milky Way. So uh, this has been done with infrared photometry and, and star counts, for example, uh, in these two papers. And they find um, a radius for the nuclear disk of the Milky Way about between um, 100 and 200 parsec with a scale height of 45 parsecs. Um, and it even has a gaseous uh, outer edge, so a nuclear ring, basically, where star formation is going on, which is um, called uh, the, the central molecular zone by, by the galactic uh, people. And the mass of the nuclear disk is estimated to be uh, almost 10 to the 9 uh, solar masses. So this is more or less consistent, to, consistent with our observations. But the understanding of this, um, of this central structure in the Milky Way is still uh, complicated. So, for example, Sormani et al. reported um, that the velocity dispersion, the vertical direction divided by the velocity dispersion of stars in the radial direction for, um, for the nuclear disk in the Milky Way is larger than one, which is difficult to understand um, in the context of a, of a thin uh, disk. So this, this remains to be, to be understood. So my last slide now with uh, a take home message is there was a lot of uh, information. So I, 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 if I could choose what I want you to grab from this talk, uh, it's basically um, three or four main points. So first of all, that the stellar kinematics and the population properties in the nuclear disks are fully consistent with a, with a bar-driven formation uh, for the nuclear disks. And this contrasts with the merger-driven formation of classical bulges. Also very importantly, the exponential or disk-like bulges that we see um, in photometric studies are uh, nuclear disks. So we can start calling them uh, nuclear disks. And these nuclear disks seem to extend all the way to the center um, and possibly to form uh, from inside out. But it's very, it's very curious that, that, that they seem to go all the way uh, to the central region. Perhaps maybe uh, if we have more spatial resolution, we can see a nuclear star cluster or even a small classical bulge in, in, in the center. But, but they are definitely not only rings, they are nuclear disks, in fact. And they seem to be uh, ubiquitous in, in um, galaxies in the same mass range as the Milky Way, which is the, the mass uh, range of, of our sample of galaxies. And in fact, the Milky Way shows also uh, a nuclear disk. Um, 
So if you want to see more details, I'm of course open for questions, but you can also look at uh, these papers that uh, were published last year. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. It was really uh, very interesting. Let me try to hear too. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, do you hear us, right? Yes, yes, I okay, do. Great, great, great. So uh, probably there will be questions so from the audience and maybe also from the people that uh, are uh, watching the talk uh, uh, online. Uh, uh, tell me something, uh, uh, what are the wavelengths of Nuse that... Uh, uh yeah, so it, it's uh, it's it's basically the whole optical wavelength, so from four thousand eight hundred yeah, angstroms yeah, yeah. to nine thousand three hundred. So, I, you, yeah, and mainly the your your targets are bar galaxies, right? Yeah, I remember we had uh, well now already more than twenty years ago we have a couple of papers with Preben Grossbaum in ninety eight. Uh, however, uh, the, these were in near infrared. And since we were interested more about the structure of the main spirals, we try to have them as unbarred as possible. But the fact is that both in that early paper, another one later that Preben did, uh, I was joining also that one. Uh, in the near infrared, we had expon inner nuclear rings exponential in the rear infrared. So the, this, the, the, the main uh, Populations there, there are K and M giants. So I'm wondering if there is some correlation between wavelengths and uh, galaxy type bar and tan bar. So I just have it as a comment. So I don't know the answer. It would be interesting, uh, interesting to to have also uh, a look at the near infrared about these inner structures. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Also because of the effects of dust. Um, Exactly, exactly. And, and, and star formation. Uh, so we could do, yeah, I, it's difficult in terms of like, there's no instrument such as Muse in the near infrared yet. I, I guess so, where to find a spectrum <laughs> to do that in the near infrared, that's the point. And also, uh, as another comment I have is that uh, you said, and it's very accurate, that these nuclear uh, regions are about 10% of the bar roughly speaking, so that in most cases, this directly points to what we call the inner limb blood resonance region, right? And all that rings like the one that uh, you just had in for 1097, et cetera, yeah. uh, more or less correlate. However, the, the structures of the stellar and the gaseous components shouldn't be identical because of uh, pressure and other forces that we have in the gas, but it is affected of that. And uh, if you want to see where star formation take place, actually, okay, you said that you have in an end body simulation, let's say the bar growing in length, but what you are interested in, uh, in actually is how the pattern speed evolves during this evolution, because this will displace the, the, the inner limb resonance region. And maybe in some cases, if this accelerates, maybe, it, 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 you, you lose at a certain point the, the, this, uh, region, the inner linear resonance, and then you have no something to hold the gas from going all the way to the center of the galaxy. So also this is one thing that one may look at. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. you're absolutely right. It's, it's, the, it's the pattern speed that, um, yeah. that matters really. And uh, yeah, uh, now of course, yeah, so, so basically, as you said, the gas is different from um, from the stars in terms of the spatial configuration. Um, and indeed, indeed, we see in many, I didn't mention this, but in many of our nuclear disks, we see the star formation at the outer edge, so basically, which is the nuclear ring, right? Yes, so exactly. basically, so the gas piles up there and there is not much star formation within that, that radius. So it's basically, yeah. seeing the... That's also yeah. very important to note because this again strengthens the argument that the inner limb of resonance is the presence of this resonance is behind yeah. all the star formation procedure. Yeah. There is all this what you have presented us as valuable information really for people that want to understand the dynamics in the region. So uh, I'm wondering if uh, uh, someone from the uh, from here from 
people watching this have to answer to ask something other some questions if not then if there is somebody from people who watching have one if there is any other question so what, what, why, why people think one thing that uh, um, we could um, discuss because you mentioned that uh, the, the linear limbed resonance, right? But I've, I've been seeing some papers where I think Sormani, for example, has a paper where he discusses other mechanisms for the formation of the, of the nuclear ring, for, for the location of the nuclear ring, right? Which are similar to the same region of the linear limbed resonance, but it's not uh, only due to the linear limbed resonance, right? There's other effects what what what's your point on this? what's your take on this look uh, yes certainly uh, one should look at the uh, radius where the the ring is and the radius where the inner limb and resonance is foreseen by some kind of prediction that you can uh, do and actually there is uh, a known point uh, in most of uh, the papers one can find in the literature the standard ways to find the rotation curve so the omega and omega minus kappa half, etc., a line, then you see where the locations. Okay, this is a rough estimation, a better estimation of the inner linear resonance uh, presence is to calculate the orbits that uh, exist there, the periodic orbits, which do not ex exist in galaxies, but they certainly uh, show you exactly uh, what to expect. And if you do that, then you have a good. Uh, uh, determination of the inner limb blood resonance region, okay? Mm -hmm. But then things are even more complicated because if you follow the response of a gaseous component to the imposed bar potential, then you will see that it is formed in the uh, uh, inner limb blood resonance region. So initially you have a, a ring there, but even if you do not consider any other evolution, but the uh, evolution of the gas in a time independent potential, let's say, then you will see that you have uh, changes with the time as the response uh, continues, also at the extent of the ring and also at the morphology of the ring, which mm. is due to uh, sound speed of the gas, due to viscosity of the gas, due to things like that. So one shouldn't expect a perfect alignment of uh, let's say x2 kind of orbits and the the, uh, the the ring but should be roughly at the center region also mm -hmm. the orientation etc should differ one can uh, check uh, compare let's say simulations and uh, observations but uh, it is very difficult to say oh this is not exactly the inner resonance region so we have to find to look for another mechanism or oh, we believe that this is the inner resonance region so we explain that exactly by the presence. Stellar and hydrodynamics are different. In the region, one has to be very careful. Mm -hmm. One other thing that uh, I'll be curious to see what you think of, I don't know if you've seen this uh, paper recently by Kim et al. Uh, Leah is also a co-author, where they, they looked at the evolution of the length of the bar with redshift and they don't see evolution and you know, because one of the ideas I'm putting forward, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, as the bar slows down, grows longer, uh, then the nuclear, the, the region where the nuclear ring should be grows as well. And then you form this nuclear disk because the nuclear ring is growing and forming stars at every uh, different concentric radius. And then you have a, a solid nuclear disk of stars in the center. But the observations, I don't know. I mean, of course, the, the more studies need to be done. There's also, there can always be problem with observations, true. But they, in their paper, they don't see uh, uh, evidence for bars getting longer with time. Which... As I said before, it, uh, you don't care so much about the length of the bar mm -hmm. to take it and have a kind of uh, zoom out, zoom in of the bar so everything goes to, to larger distance. But if you have a slowdown of the bar, that makes sense. If you have a slowdown of the bar, then the resonances are going to larger distances. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. even if uh, the bar is in the same, has the same length, right. or rotation, for instance, will be further out. And this will take with it all the inner and outer, but inner resonances and the inner resonance as well. So yeah. it will have 
such an uh, expansion expansion just to describe the, what, yeah. how it will look will look like with time without having a, any kind of uh, uh, elongation of the bar mm. so you don't care so much about the elongation but about the how uh, slower the bar is getting with yeah. time yeah that's a good point okay so if there is any other question uh, I don't see any one raising the hand. So then, uh, Dimitri, thank you again for the nice talk. Keep in thank touch. You. Yes, thank uh, you for the invite. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we will be uh, in Athens and uh, can discuss all these things in, per in person. D drop me a line whenever it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and you are invited to, to be here and give a talk yeah. uh, whenever you can do that. We are very much interested. We'll be in touch. About, uh, work that so thanks bye, -bye everybody ciao ciao, ciao.